This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. I'm normal. My wife is normal. But my daughters are each more foolish than the other. Nancy writes lies about me. Diana's the most hated woman in the country. Jessica's missing off the face of the earth. And unity is in the arms of Hitler. The Mitfords were your perfectly typical 1920s aristocratic English family. David was a peer in the House of Lords, while Sydney ran the household. Together, they had six perfectly atypical daughters. Nancy, Pam, Diana, Unity, Jessica and Deborah. And a son called Tom, which everyone forgets. He's the Rob Kardashian, Branwell Bronte of the family. Growing up in country houses around Oxfordshire, they were cousins of the Churchills and only really mixed with children of their own class. Although Tom went to Eton, the girls were homeschooled by a revolving set of nannies, each with their own questionable curriculum. Today's lesson is shoplifting. Now in you go, children, and try a little jiggery-pokery. Not being allowed to go to school was frustrating for most of them, but agonising for Jessica. She once confronted her father. Tom goes to school, so why can't we? Tom's a boy and you're a girl. Amelia Earhart's a girl, and she just flew across the Atlantic. She's a mannequin. That doesn't count. So without school, they turned to the library. All of them read ferociously and developed an appetite for self-learning. There wasn't much else to do out in the country. They only had each other and animals to play with. They developed their own rules, social norms, and even accent. Nancy was the funny one. Her wit made for an excellent novelist, but a mean older sister. She was a cosmic teaser. She once told Unity Jessica and me that our names came from Knit, Sick and Boar. Nancy was too sharp-tongued to be anyone's favourite sister. Pam was the clever one. All the sisters had to raise chickens and pigs for pocket money. They paid rent to David for the land and got to keep any profits. A young Pam contacted local farmers about their finances. Realising she was paying more for the land than the commercial average, she unionised the other children and led negotiations for reduced rent. Diana was the beautiful one. At 16, the French artist Paul Alou drew a series of portraits of her. He was in love with me, which complicated things. Even Churchill called her Diana Might. Unity was the strange one. She loved to shock. Instead of a necklace for society balls, she'd wear a snake. She'd stand there stroking it as if daring young men to speak to her. If she felt the party was boring, she'd let it escape. Jessica, or Decker, was the rebellious one. At age nine, she'd write to companies pretending to be a shop owner in the hope they'd send her free samples. I particularly enjoyed Benja's baby food. It was lovely. But apart from her pet sheep Miranda, Decker found country life boring and dreamt of running away. Deborah was the nice one. As the youngest, she did all she could to keep the peace, even when Diana, Unity and Decker were making international headlines and the family were at each other's throats. Deborah was the bridge between them all. They were all clever, funny, motivated children, but they grew up in isolation and were rarely challenged by anyone except each other. They developed an unreasonable level of self-confidence and belief in themselves. As adults, this gave them the ability to do whatever they wanted, but not necessarily the perspective to judge the consequences. Their social status and class expected women to marry well, keep their mouth shut and run a house, preferably a manor. Even their own father spoke up in the House of Lords to protest women joining the chamber. It would be a waste of public money if we had to build a women's bathroom. So when they turned 18, they each had a debutante ball to introduce them to society and find a suitable husband. Sydney would sit in a room with the other chaperones, while the sisters usually snuck out the back to a more interesting party. The Roaring Twenties were London High Society's answer to the Great Depression. For a privileged group of friends, there were parties every night. Toga parties, Russian parties, clown parties and treasure hunt parties. The winners will be the first team back here with a policeman's hat, a lamppost and a duck. The group were dubbed by the press Bright Young Things, and nearly all of them would go on to be famous actors, writers, artists and photographers. Notable members included John Betjeman, Cecil Beaton, Evelyn Moore, and Nancy and Diana Mitford. John Betjeman, the future poet laureate, wrote a poem about the Mitford sisters and once proposed to Pam. Sophistication, blessed dame, sure they have heard her call. Yes, even gentle Pamela, the most royal of them all. She declined Betjeman, accepting another young man's proposal. But then he got tuberculosis. In the end, she just gave the engagement ring to Unity and went to run a farm. Years later, when asked what happened to the ring, Unity said, Oh, that. I gave it to Hitler. Diana married within weeks of her debutante ball to fellow bright young thing Brian Guinness. 
She regularly featured in newspapers as an icon of youth and sophistication. This was an era where journalists would write about the latest dinner party or the colour palette of a woman's drawing room. To the outside world, she had everything. Family, beauty and wealth. Then she met Oswald Mosley. To anyone in Britain today, the name Oswald Mosley is associated with fascism, anti-Semitism and the Nazi regime. But in 1930, he was a young, charismatic public speaker who had taken British politics by storm. Suppose people had stood on the shores when Drake and Raleigh set out to the New World and told them, No, don't go today. The sea looks rough. Thousands attended his speeches. His ideas had support across the political spectrum. Many people regarded him as the next Prime Minister. Diana Mitford fell madly in love with him. They began a not-so-secretive affair, meeting at every opportunity, not caring who saw them. Eventually, Diana decided to leave Brian, but Mosley would not leave his wife. Diana knew that divorce alone could be socially damaging, but she was proposing to live openly as another man's mistress, a man firmly in the public eye with a wife and three children. Nancy begged her to reconsider. Darling, you are so young to be getting in wrong with the world. I believe you have a much worse time in store than you imagine. Mosley left conventional politics to set up his own party, the British Union of Fascists. He started dressing members in black uniforms and held rallies promoting a totalitarian style of government as the only solution to mass unemployment and the threat of communism. Diana began working at the BUF and wholeheartedly shared his vision for a far-right Europe. At 22, she left Brian to live closer to Mosley. That same month, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany. Unity, Decker and Deborah were still children stuck out in the country. The three youngest sisters were incredibly close. They called each other Bode and created their own language, Bodelage. They were so fluent they could talk without being understood by adults. They formed the Society of Ons, labelling people they didn't like a counter-on and launching propaganda campaigns against them. Decker hadn't been allowed to visit the homes of other local girls because Sydney did not know their parents. Even as a child, Decker realised this was a euphemism for not the right type of parents. This experience of class divide deeply affected Decker, especially as the younger sisters were beginning to realise their home life was unusual. By the time I was 13, major storms were brewing outside the Mitford Fortress. Population centres were designated distressed areas. I read in the papers of the hunger marches, the Great Depression and the fighting in the streets. Thanks to Nancy and Diana, the Mitford girls already had a reputation. Decker and Unity both felt the need to forge their own identity. They read books, pamphlets, leaflets, any political literature they could get their hands on. Although best friends, they were drawn to separate ideology. When Bode became a fascist, I declared myself a communist. We had chosen opposite sides in the conflict of the day. Their room was separated into two halves, pictures of Hitler on one side, Lenin on the other. When the family had guests round, Unity would ask, Are you a fascist or a communist? One visitor replied, Neither. I'm a Democrat. Oh, how wet. It's worth remembering that the words fascism, communism, Hitler and Stalin didn't then carry the historical weight they do today. Their horrors wouldn't be truly displayed for another few years. In the early 1930s, there were many that viewed fascism and communism as legitimate alternatives that wouldn't necessarily lead to abuses of power. All the Mitford girls had a finishing year in France before coming out to society. No respectable lady is without conversational French. Except Unity, she requested her year of study be in Germany. In Munich, Unity became infatuated, obsessed with Hitler. She befriended guards at the Nazi headquarters to get information on his movements and then built her timetable around it. She discovered a cafe he visited regularly. One day, I got a telephone call to say that he was there. I jumped straight in a taxi. I sat at the table opposite the Führer. I was shaking so violently I had to put down my cup. Unity went to the cafe every day while Hitler was in the city. She dropped her teaspoon in the hopes of being noticed by him. Eventually, he began to nod at her, and then one day, the restaurant owner came over. The Führer would like to speak to you. It was the most wonderful, beautiful moment of my life. I went over to him, and he stood up and saluted and shook hands and introduced me to all the others. I can't tell you of all the things we talked about. I told him he ought to come to England, and he said he would love to, but he was afraid there would be a revolution. Then we spoke of London, films, the new road system being constructed all over Germany. After all that, you can imagine what I felt like. I'm so happy that I wouldn't mind a bit dying. I suppose I am the luckiest girl in the world. 
According to Unity's diary, she would go on to speak to Hitler 140 times before the war. She was invited to parties and rallies as his esteemed guest. They would talk privately in his apartment for hours. It was the greatest moment of my life, sitting at the Führer's feet and having him stroke my hair. Hitler was clearly captivated by Unity too. She could be funny and had the confidence to engineer those initial meetings. Many of Hitler's inner circle believed her to be a spy. Hitler would defend her to them time and time again. It was clear they had a unique relationship in every possible way. She called him Wolf and he called her Kind Child. They gave each other gifts like Pam's engagement ring and Unity even claimed he gave her a gun, saying all women should know how to defend themselves. Although Unity was certainly in love with him, there's no evidence their relationship was ever sexual. Not that that stopped the British press from speculating. When Unity wrote an open letter urging England to recognise the Jewish danger, newspapers ran the headlines, The Girl Who Adores Hitler, and Pia's Daughter Is Jew Hater. This crushed David, who was firmly against fascism. He refused to ever meet Hitler or Mosley. Sydney, however, loved Hitler, dining with him and Unity several times. Pam met him once, describing him as Very ordinary, like an old farmer in a brown suit. Diana was the only other sister taken in by him. Hitler was naturally interested in her connections to Mosley. After Mosley's wife died, he and Diana married in secret at the house of Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda. Hitler's wedding present to the couple was a framed photograph of himself. Interestingly, Diana was perhaps the only person in the world to be close friends with both Churchill and Hitler. She tried to persuade them to meet, but both always declined. By now, Nancy had written several books and her career had begun to take off. Her novel, Wigs on the Green, is a satire of British fascism. Stories of Unity, Diana and Mosley all appear with little done to hide their identity. Nancy was horrified by the rise of fascism in Britain. When Diana invited her to a BUF event, she made a point of declining in Yiddish. Meanwhile, Decker began to hear stories of her rebellious cousin Esmond Romilly. As the nephew of Winston Churchill, his exploits had made the papers. He had been expelled from school, joined the International Brigade in the Spanish Civil War, and was now running a left-wing magazine out of a bookshop in London. He was Decker's hero. There was a marvellous photo of him, at which I used to gaze wistfully. At a dinner party, they eventually met. I heard you were going back to Spain. I was, well, well, I was wondering if you could possibly take me with you. Esmond immediately agreed and they hatched a plan. Decker would falsify a letter from a friend, inviting her on a road trip of Austria. This meant her parents would never be able to verify her location. She emptied her bank account and obtained a visa travelling as Esmond's secretary. She was about to achieve her childhood dream of leaving the Mitford Fortress, with a man she already loved, all while fighting on the front line in the war against fascism. Esmond hid at the other end of the platform while Decker said goodbye to her parents. She felt guilty as they gave her spending money. It would be the last time Decker would ever see her father. She was 19 years old. Eventually, they arrived in Spain and found work writing news dispatches about the war. Test firing rifles was the closest Decker ever got to fighting. Meanwhile, Sydney had contacted the mother of Decker's friend in Austria and discovered the lie. Given her allegiance to the Communist Party, they feared she had gone to Russia. She's probably lying dead in a ditch somewhere. Esmond wrote to his mother, admitting everything. Decker and I are in Spain. By the time you read this, we shall be married. Any attempt by the Mitfords to get her back, and I shall leak to the papers the truth about Unity and Hitler. When the news made it back to the Mitfords, David sank into his armchair. Good gracious! She didn't take any clothes to fight in. It's worse than I thought. Married to a wobbly. Through Churchill, the Foreign Secretary got involved, and he cabled the British Consul in Spain. Find Jessica Mitford and persuade her to return. Stop. However, the consul was out when the message arrived. Esmond intercepted it and forged a reply. Have found Jessica Midford. Impossible to persuade her to return. Stop. By now, the papers had got hold of the story, and thanks to the fame of Unity and Diana, plus Esmond's connection to Churchill, it made headlines across Europe. Unity wrote to Decker. I spoke to Hitler, and he has forbidden it to appear in the German papers, which was very nice of him, wasn't it? As for Esmond, I hate communists as much as he hates Nazis. I naturally wouldn't hesitate to shoot him if it was necessary for my cause, and I should expect him to do the same to me. But in the meantime, I don't see why we shouldn't be quite good friends. 
At this point, the British ambassador met with Esmond and Decker. He was coordinating the Royal Navy in the evacuation of refugees. If you do not board that ship and leave Spain, I will tell the press bureau that Britain will no longer be cooperating in the evacuation of refugees. This was probably a bluff, but Esmond and Decker agreed to leave as long as they could disembark in France. Deborah was deeply affected by all this. While her three closest sisters were being torn apart by politics and the press, she alone faced the fallout at home. She wrote to Decker. Favre goes off to the House of Lords and Muv sits around reading books like Stalin, my father, Mussolini, the man, or Hitler, my great aunt's brother's son-in-law. Oh, Debo, your letters do make me roar. It was now 1939, and war in Europe was seeming more and more likely. Decker and Desmond set sail to America. The couple were welcomed by New York society. The war hero nephew of Winston Churchill and his funny, posh English wife were a hit at every party. While Decker was happy to denounce the rest of her family as Nazis, she could never bring herself to cut ties with unity. Although I hated everything Bode stood for, we had a bond. She was easily my favourite sister. Unity was becoming increasingly concerned that war would mean disaster for her two favourite countries. I cannot stand to see England and Germany tear themselves apart. She made it a personal mission to stop the approaching war, begging Hitler to seek alternatives. In 1939, Hitler gave Unity her own apartment in Munich and even agreed to help her furnish it. Unity must have known that the Jewish family who owned the apartment before hadn't gone abroad, as was claimed. By this point, the Nazi treatment of the Jews was clear for all to see. Even if Unity didn't know their ultimate fate, she still rejoiced at stories of Jewish people being humiliated in the street or being made to cut grass with their teeth. Unity's innocence and naivety is often cited to explain her actions but they cannot extend to this. On the 3rd of September, she received a telegram that Britain had declared war on Germany. This is to say goodbye. I send my best love to you all, and particularly my bode when you write. If anything should happen to me, and the English press try to make some untrue story out of it against Wolfe, you will see to it that the truth is known, won't you? She then walked to the English gardens, her favourite spot in Munich, and took the gun from her bag. The bullet had gone through her head and embedded in the back of her skull. Somehow she survived, but with severe brain damage. Hitler banned all news or reporting of the incident, so it was two months before the family in England learned what happened. The press, however, only got half of an incorrect story. This is how Decker, 5,000 miles away, read in the newspapers that her favourite sister had died. In some articles, she'd been killed during a row with Hitler, and in others, she'd been shot by the Nazi high command and buried in an unmarked grave. Hitler arranged a train to take Unity to hospital in Switzerland. This is where Sidney and Deborah were able to collect her. She had an odd, vacant expression. I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for my mother, seeing her like that. But it wasn't just her appearance. She was a completely changed person. The journey back was through Europe, now at war. Every time the train jolted, stopped and started, it was torture for her. It was a long, dark and cold journey and Unity was so ill. Once home, David rushed up and kissed her. There began a rare family truce for those early weeks of recovery. Unity kept repeating sentences and asking the same questions. Where is my boat? I thought you all hated me, but I don't remember why. She would recover physically, but remain childlike and in need of care the rest of her life. When a goat gave birth to twins, Unity excitedly wrote to Decker. It must have broke Decker's heart to see the childish scrawl and pictures. Although glad to see Unity alive and happy, the papers were right. The best friend she'd left behind had died in Munich. During the war, Nancy worked in first aid, took in families of Jewish refugees, in the evening wrote her autobiography, and even found time for a relationship with Gaston Palowski, the French politician and close friend of Charles de Gaulle. Nancy fell deeply and madly in love with him. For him, it was just another affair. Nancy was furious with Sidney and Diana's support of Hitler. The authorities even questioned Nancy about Diana's visits to Germany. I advised them to examine her passport to see how often she went. I also said I regard her as an extremely dangerous person. Not very sisterly behaviour, but in such times, I think it one's duty. At the beginning of the war, Diana and Mosley were possibly the most hated people in Britain. News of their marriage and Hitler's attendance had got out. If Germany invaded Britain, many people assumed Mosley would be the Nazis' puppet dictator. They were both arrested and imprisoned without trial. 
Diana was taken to Holloway Prison and given nothing but a thin mattress in her cell. She slept to the sound of air raid sirens and the bombs falling on London. Once, a direct hit burst the main sewer, flooding the cells with sewage for three days. The only thing that saved me was the thought it was temporary. Had I known I'd been there years, I would have died. It was Pam who looked after Diana's children. She and her husband, the world-renowned physicist Derek Jackson, were unable to have their own. I had Derek, the animals and the children. The war years were busy for me, but not unhappy. Decker and Esmond were fairly isolated from the war, but when Esmond's brother was taken prisoner, he felt his duty was to return to England and fight. I'll probably find myself being commanded by one of your ghastly relations. Their letters to each other during this time are filled with stories of their new baby, how much they love, miss each other, and the horrors of war. My four closest friends have been killed. It is a cruel blow from something against which it is impossible to strike back. War is so huge and powerful, and at the same time so vague and shadowy. Very much love, darling angel, Esmond. The next message she received was a telegram. 2nd of December, 1941. Mrs. E. M. Romilly, regret to inform that your husband, Esmond Romilly, missed on active service. Stop. Five days later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and America joined the war. Churchill was in Washington to meet the president, and while there, he also met with Decker. Churchill told her that Esmond's plane had gone down 110 miles from shore in the freezing North Sea. No one could have survived more than 20 minutes in the water. Trying to comfort Decker, but unaware of the family politics, he explained that Diana's prison cell had been cleaned to make life easier for her. Why is Diana being pampered by servants when her precious friends have just killed Esmond? If you want to comfort me, have Diana and Mosley put against a wall and shot. During the war, Deborah married Lord Andrew Cavendish, second son of the Duke of Devonshire. Congratulations, Debo. You so very nearly got a duke. Oh, Decker, don't be such a counter on. It was Andrew's older brother, Billy, that was heir to the dukedom. He was married to the American Kit Kennedy, sister of the future president. However, not long after the ceremony, Billy died in the war and Kit died in a plane crash. The title of duke passed down to Andrew. At 23, Deborah became heir to a duchy and one of the largest estates in England. After three and a half years in prison, Mosley became very ill. The authorities feared that death in prison would only make a martyr of him. Both husband and wife were released under strict supervision. 20,000 people gathered in protest. The Mitford family were once again front page news. Tom had spent the war fighting across Europe and Africa. With only a few months left, he was hit by a round of machine fire. Tom died aged 36. It seems like a lifetime since I last saw him. He was one of the few people in England I was really looking forward to seeing again. We are only one family of thousands all over the world. And what a world it has become, all black and dark. The end of the war was welcome, but it had cost Sydney. Tom, Esmond, Billy, four nephews, her relationship with Decca, Diana and her marriage. And then quite suddenly, Unity became ill. She was rushed to hospital with an infection in her old head wound. Nine years after her suicide attempt, she died, aged 33. Decca wrote to Sydney. Of course, I'm heartbroken, but I mourned for her when I first realised we could no longer be friends. She mourned for you too. She knew you'd probably never meet again, but her love for you was quite unchanged. She was always going back in her mind to when she was young, when you were all there. I could never understand my daughters. But I think you understood each other. Nancy wrote a trilogy of books about an aristocratic English family. The character Uncle Matthew is an irritable lord at his country house in Oxford. Jassie dreams of running away, and her devoted friend Matt leaves school to join the Spanish Civil War. You get the idea. The books were international bestsellers and helped turn the Mitford myth into legend. Nancy became a rich celebrity author and an icon of the English upper class. She moved to Paris to be closer to Pulaski. Why do all my daughters fall for dictators? Nancy had a hugely successful career, but an unhappy personal life. Pulaski never gave her his full attention or love. She developed Hodgkin's disease and so began a long, painful illness. She was looked after by two unlikely enemies. Decker and Diana kept vigil by her bedside in Paris. It is curious meeting Diana again after 34 years. She's a beautiful, ageing sculpture. We stayed off politics and only spoke of Nancy. 
Nancy died in 1973, a cult figure and hero to many. Pam and Derek divorced in 1951. For the next 40 years, she lived with her Italian girlfriend, Giudita Tomasi. Together, they smuggled rare breeds of chickens into the UK and were happy to be the favorite aunts of many nieces and nephews. Dana and Mosley could never accept that their association with the Nazis had ruined their political careers. They spent the rest of their lives campaigning for a united Europe. The British Empire is failing, and alone we can no longer rival the USA or the USSR. Diana eventually denounced the Nazis and anti-Semitism, but it was generally seen as too little too late. When she appeared on British radio in 1989, she still spoke of Hitler with fondness. He was extraordinarily fascinating and clever. He had mesmerizing blue eyes. She knew this would make the papers and cause massive public outcry, mainly from Decca. To this day, Diana is remembered as a figure of controversy, shock and hate. After the war, Decker was furious at the injustices faced by black veterans, and she became secretary of the Civil Rights Congress. In 1951, Decker was personally involved in the case of Willie McGee, a young black man sentenced to death. They were unable to stop the execution, but led mass protests in Mississippi, standing off against the Ku Klux Klan. Decker described herself as a professional muckraker, causing trouble wherever she saw abuses of power. She spent five years as an investigative journalist in the funeral industry, visiting undertakers in disguise as a soon-to-be widow to see how they talked up from a wooden box to a marble mausoleum. Well, we could use the red wood, but we'll have to cut off his feet. The result was a fantastic expose in 1963 called The American Way of Death. The book was number one in the bestseller charts for months, and the reason JFK was buried in a simple coffin. It made Jessica Mitford a celebrity in the United States. She spent the rest of her life lecturing and writing on every topic imaginable. When asked in an interview what she wanted for her own funeral, she joked, Oh, nothing fancy. Just six black horses with plumes, streets to be closed off, proclamations to be issued, that sort of thing. When the time came, her many friends honoured the joke. 500 people marched through the streets of San Francisco following six black horses attached to an antique glass hearse filled with her books and articles. Deborah, Her Grace the Dowager Duchess of Devonshire, was the last Mitford. She and Andrew inherited Chatsworth House, a run-down stately home in the Derbyshire countryside. It's only slightly larger than Versailles, 178 rooms and not a single bath. Over 50 years, Deborah brought it back to life. It required the largest renovations the house had seen in 200 years. She opened it to the public in the 1980s and is regarded today as one of the UK's finest country houses. Deborah remained good friends with the Kennedy family. When Howard Macmillan visited the US in 1962, Deborah accompanied him to smooth relations with the president. She and the president got on very well. Rather too well, Nancy would tease. He stayed at Chatsworth during the Cuban Missile Crisis and Deborah once rang Decker from the telephone in the Oval Office. When she died in 2014, Deborah was admired by the public in a different way to the others. She represented not only the last of the Mitfords, but the end of an era in British history. The story of the Mitfords is one of confidence. They were born in a time that expected them to be the obedient wives of aristocrats, yet they stuck their head above the parapet to make their own mark on the world. Some of those marks were abhorrent and ugly. The same self-assuredness that led them to success also blinded them to ideology. However individually remarkable, they were presented to the world as a group. Their story captured the public imagination like no other. It had sex, money, sibling rivalry, politics and drama, times six. My favourite quote to describe the sisters' relationship comes from Nancy and Decker. Sisters are a shield against life's cruel adversity. But darling, sisters are life's cruel adversity. Apart from already being wealthy members of the aristocracy, the secret to the Mitford's success was their obsessive self-learning. To be insightful and well-rounded people, they had to read, enrol in college courses, visit libraries and do investigative journalism. Why? Because they didn't have The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an amazing online learning service with over 11,000 video lectures. You can take courses in history, physics, travel and music. You can learn to cook, draw, train a dog or crochet anything that interests you. While writing about Decker running away to Spain in this video, I realized I didn't know anything about the Spanish Civil War. So I searched for it on The Great Courses Plus and watched a lecture about it from a world leading professor. It was so good, I ended up going back through the course and learning about the entire history of Spain. 
Now the Great Courses Plus are giving viewers of this channel unlimited access to their library of courses by visiting thegreatcoursesplus.com slash human. Click the link in the description below to start your free trial today. It's great being able to learn and study whatever you want without the stress of homework or tests. If school or university kind of put you off studying like it did me, then the Great Courses Plus is perfect for making learning enjoyable again. I want to say a big thank you to all the people who worked really hard to make this video possible, and to Rugnavalda Thomas and Everett Higginbotham, along with all my other Patreon supporters. Thank you for subscribing.